a moment. I want to um, start off by letting you know that Karen's going to be taking questions at the end of this webinar. If you have any questions along the way, feel free to chat them in. On the right-hand side of your screen, you should see a little icon is in the shape of a, of a bubble. And that's our chat feature for today. So feel free to type your questions in there. And then a copy of Karen's presentation along with a link to this video um, will be sent to you on Monday. So we are very excited to have Karen here with us today. Uh, she is a psychologist of 25 years. Uh, she's in private practice here um, in Lexington, Mass, and is also a lecturer on psychiatry at Harvard Med School. Welcome, Karen. Thank you. Huh. Should we get started? We can. Okay, well, thanks, everyone. Um, I hope you all can hear and obviously let Joanne know if there are technical difficulties along the way. Um, my goal today is to um, hopefully be helpful to you in terms of giving you an overview orientation to a little about anxiety and a lot about uh, treatment. Um, and I always think it's a little bit ironic um, when I give uh, workshops or especially webinars about anxiety because it's a fairly anxiety-provoking thing to do. So I get to practice um, what I'm talking about all the way through. <laughs> and um, I wish we were all together because then you all could co-regulate and I could tell when you're glazing over. But um, this is another good way to, to reach people more easily. Okay. Now let's see if we can progress. Okay. I'm going to be covering some material that um, Naomi Chet and I have written about in our uh, books and chapters, especially the Attack and Anxiety book. So I say this not by way of advertisement, but more disclaimer, although it ends up sounding like an advertisement. This is just a list of other places where I've written about uh, things related to what I'm talking about today. So that will be in your handouts if you want. So first I'm going to talk about anxiety in general, um, how it works in general for kids on the spectrum, and then um, uh, spend a bit more time on treatment, um, including anxiety myths and phobia-specific treatment, as well as the big-picture treatment for generalized anxiety. Anxiety is very common. It's the most common presenting problem for kids in psychotherapy in general. Um, another way of looking at it, um, other Co-occurring mental health diagnoses are very common in kids on the autism spectrum, including anxiety. Um, and another way of uh, thinking about it is uh, anxiety is very common in kids with a whole range of different developmental differences. So um, different studies come up with different percentages depending how you measure anxiety, depending on how you measure autism spectrum. But around half of kids with an ASD diagnosis also have some kind of anxiety-related diagnosis. And for other developmental uh, groups with developmental challenges, like Williams syndrome, it's uh, 60 to 90 percent have anxiety. Fragile X syndrome, it's way up there. There are a lot of possible reasons for this, some biological, some developmental. And we can talk more about that if, if people want to, but I wanted to move on today. Um, obviously, there's useful adaptive anxiety, and um, not enough anxiety is as much of a problem as too much anxiety is. Some fear is very adaptive, helping us to avoid danger. Um, fearless people are at huge risks, um, and fear becomes maladaptive when it's way out of proportion with the event, when it causes intense distress for the person, um, like kids who are upset every day before school because of separation or because of schoolwork or in case there might be a fire drill or in case they might hear a swear word. Um, and when it causes anxiety is a problem when it causes a person to avoid situations that would otherwise be fun or productive for them. Um, how does, uh, oh, and one thing I, I meant to add before is, you know, some kids can have, and this isn't uncommon at all, and for kids with ASD, they might have too much anxiety in some areas and not enough in others. Um, so how does anxiety look uh, for kids on the spectrum? How do you know if your kid is anxious? I would say generally parents know. You can see it, feel it, hear it in your child usually uh, comes out in terms of repeated question asking, uh, similar question, lots and lots of reassurance about the same thing. Is this going to happen? How's it going to happen? Um, worry or distress or avoidance. Uh, sometimes that comes manifest in terms of avoiding something. Sometimes it could come out as meltdown or um, anger about something. So the, there's the fight or flight system, which is really the same general system in the brain, 
um, but it can look very different. Uh, anxiety definitely can disrupt attention, um, as we all know, and sometimes it can be hard to um, figure that out. Is it the primary attention problem, primary anxiety problem? Um, but usually, uh, you know, if you treat the anxiety, it gets better and better, and if, um, that usually helps attention. So they both go hand in hand. Then there's obsessive compulsive disorder, that OCD, that looks a little bit different, but it's really the flip side of anxiety. Um, uh, so people do, do repeated hand washing, or sometimes it's counting, or have obsessive intrusive thoughts that keep coming up. Um, obsessive apologizing. I've seen several kids with that kind of um, OCD. Having to do things, having to get your pencils uh, just right. Um, uh, having to have things symmetry. Sometimes if you touch something on one side, you have to touch on the other side. Anxiety has a lot of physical manifestations. Uh, um, they're a little bit different from person to person, but often difficulty sleeping or too much sleeping, not enough eating or too much eating. It's one of my patients patients puts it. She says, I'm a stress eater. Um, GI problems, breathing problems, heart racing, chest pain, sweating, foot jiggling, skin picking, nail biting. None of those symptoms are specific to anxiety, but they all um, generally go with it, or they can go with it. When's it a problem that warrants treatment? Um, if it's interfering in a significant way, taking up a lot of your child's energy or your energy, um, creating problems uh, for the child and people around them, um, and also when what you've been doing hasn't been, been sufficient to really help fix it. Okay, there's some common anxiety myths that are uh, kind of in our culture, certainly uh, often in uh, myths held by people who don't, often don't specialize in treating anxiety. Sometimes I see this when I'm uh, consulting to schools as well. Um, one myth um, is that an on-again, off-again uh, phobic response is behavioral or volitional. So a child that sometimes does fine um, with the school lockdown and sometimes totally freaks out or with an exam or with whatever it is. Um, if, if they're sometimes fine with it, it's harder for people to kind of t read that that's anxiety. But it may well depend on the child's baseline anxiety level. And for treatment, this is really key because if you're going to work on gradually helping a child tolerate more and more of what's distressing them, um, you, want an, you want their baseline down really low to for them to tolerate that. And if their baseline is high, any little bit of trigger is going to cause uh, intense distress. And here's an illustration of, of that. So if your baseline is low, the same trigger event, let's say there's, there's an exam, a pop quiz, you might be fine with it. Um, but another day, your baseline is high, or later in the day, same thing happens in another class, um, it might lead you to an unmanageable uh, amount of anxiety. What can be complicated for kids, particularly for kids who can be good at looking okay or holding it together, um, is that they may uh, look like they're at this level, but they may actually be up at this level. Often if several things have happened in the course of a day or a week or a month, um, someone's baseline might be just higher. Um, and, and even in the course of a day, let's say something's happened in the morning that's been really upsetting, that might raise the baseline but they might seem like they're back okay, even though their whole nervous system might still be at this much higher level. So some small thing can be, you know, the straw that breaks the panel's back and can send somebody into more intense anxiety. Okay, another myth, commonly common myth is that uh, reassurance helps and um, telling a child something is no big deal helps. Certainly it's, it's a first line of defense if that works, great. Um, but if that works, it probably wasn't a huge anxiety to begin with. I mean, imagine, you know, you have fear of flying and you're sitting in a plane and trying not to vomit and getting all shaky and anxious and the person next to you says, oh, it's no big deal. It probably won't be enough to help you. And, and if it was, you probably, your fear of flying probably isn't too bad to begin with. The problem with reassurance, even though it's all of our natural tendencies, is that it begets the need for more reassurance. And those of you with anxious kids, I'm sure, have experienced this. You reassure them one time what's going to happen, and they'll ask again, and they'll ask again in a different way, in a different way, sometimes with anxiety mounting with each time. Okay, another myth um, that I often see in kids' behavior plans is um, that gradual exposure means increasing the amounts of exposure of the whole experience. So let's say there's a child who's scared to go in their cafeteria, and it might be the, the sounds or the smells or the busyness, the noise. Um, it could be any number of things. Um, so maybe they have in their behavior plan that they'll spend one minute and then five minutes and ten minutes in the cafeteria. Um, and if that works, great. But if it doesn't work, it may be that one minute is too much. It may be that the whole experience at once is too much. And then you have to do what I call unbundling and, and 
have experience in the cafeteria with no other kids have experience in the cafeteria right after lunch so you get exposure to the smells. Work on each strand of the sounds, the smells, the busyness, the number of people. Um, have experience with just sitting at a table with a couple of friends who they're very comfortable with and add in bit by bit. So the unbundling makes the gradual exposure process much more tolerable and, and pleasurable. And I'll talk more about that as we go on. Um, another common myth is that because a trigger actually causes some kind of discomfort, that the anxiety around it can't be treated, for instance, around medical procedures or sensory uh, overload kinds of situations, high sensory situations. Um, and it's true we can't remove the pain of those situations, um, but we can often treat the anxiety, and there's a lot of reason to try to do that because when we're in a more anxious state, we experience pain more intensely or discomfort more intensely. Our tolerance for that goes way down. Um, so if we can treat the anxiety around it, it's not only helpful in the preamble, building up to these situations and, after, and remembering them, but it can actually help the whole experience be less uh, stressful. Okay, and when do you, who, who's supposed to help with anxiety? Parents, school, the individual, or professionals? Um, well, it takes a village. It, it really does. Um, and uh, um, if, if everybody, if the school and family have tried and it's not working, it's not getting better enough, then certainly professional help is um, often very helpful. Um, but even when there are professionals involved, often the day-to-day, minute-to-minute treatment is really um, for the parents in school, you know, depending on what the issue is and where it takes place, to work on um, uh, in conjunction with the professional, because often it, you need to eventually work on the, if it's a fear or phobia, you need to work on it in the situation where it happens eventually. If it's generalized anxiety, then we're, we're going to talk more about that in a few minutes, but then everybody can work on it together. Anxiety is often um, conceptualized as a vicious cycle between your anxious thoughts, your anxious feelings, uh, and your anxious actions. And all these three uh, impact each other um, and can happen all at once or uh, one after the other. In general, um, a typical anxious uh, thought pattern is this is going to be unbearable and awful. I won't be able to cope. And anxious feelings, as we talked about, are the, the phys physical manifestations, the racing heart, sweating, shallow breathing, reddening. And then anxious actions are the, the fight, flight, freeze uh, system. And um, the more you have anxious thoughts, the more you'll have anxious feelings and vice versa. Um, in the old days, they did studies before they were the ethics they are now. Um, giving people uh, medicine that gave them anxious physical feelings and then their anxious thoughts tended to take over. So even just having these physical feelings can impact your thoughts. Um, anxious thoughts obviously impact your behavior as do anxious feelings. So all these three are very closely tied together even though um, this diagram makes them look like three separate systems. Anxiety, the thoughts and feelings, um, results in a lens that distorts. Um, it distorts the, the present. It distorts your experience as you're going through it. And that's what I was talking about before with if you're in an anxious state and have to have a flu shot or whatever it is, it's going to be a lot more unpleasant than if you're in a calm state, probably actually more. Um, the same way if you're anxious uh, about it and you're anxious, then you're going to perceive it as much more aversive than it is. Um, anxiety distorts your memories of experiences, and um, this can get very confusing, um, particularly uh, if, let's say, a child's having a pretty good time at school and one bad thing happens that's fairly small and manageable, but if they're anxious, they may re that may be the thing that they remember. So they go home and tell their parents, school was horrible, I'm never going back there, um, because their, their anxious way of processing has distorted, um, so that's what they remember. Um, and then anxiety also distorts the future. It distorts your anticipation of how bad something's going to be, fills us with dread. So that same child might wake up, you know, at 4 in the morning dreading going back to school because it was so horrible the day before. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's important to know and then to take other, get other sources of data to find out if there are other ways of, uh, if, if that perception and memory and anticipation are accurate in terms of, obviously they're accurate in terms of some of the child's experience, but accurate in terms of the whole experience. Here's a common, in general, uh, the anxious mind overestimates the size of the threat and, and underestimates their own coping. So they, instead of seeing the actual threat as fairly minimal and their actual coping as quite strong, they see it the other way. 
that this thing is going to be way horrible and they have no capacity to cope with it. And when you're when the demands exceed your capacity and you're anxious, then that generally is a formula for anxiety. When the perceived demands exceed your perceived capacity. There are a lot of other um, cognitive errors that people have uh, described uh, that people with anxiety um, make. And some of them are common in the cognitive style of people on the autism spectrum, which you know kind of le leads back to the thinking, okay, why is anxiety so common in this population? One is misperceiving with confidence other people's thoughts or feelings. So people with anxiety are more likely to think someone else is mad at them, someone else is ignoring them, something bad about that situation and be very confident that they're correct when they are misperceiving that. And then think about someone with, with um, difficulty perceiving um, social cues in the first place and, and add in anxiety. Um, black and white thinking is very common when people are anxious. This is the one, what I was saying before, one bad moment is going to make it all horrible. Um, making one mistake is going to ruin your work, um, that kind of thing. And again, that's a common uh, cognitive style in, in people on the autism spectrum. Catastrophizing, um, imagining the worst will happen. Jumping to conclusions with insufficient information. So you overhear a little bit of a conversation and you think that means this horrible thing is going to happen. Filtering out good data that doesn't fit with your own misperceptions. So once you've misperceived, in general, we, we um, attend to what fits with our hypotheses. So then you take in what fits with your misperception. Let's see. Um, and often there are multiple misperceptions at once. So a child might say, I looked at the weather for next week, and now I know for sure it's going to rain when the kids come over for my birthday, and it will be horrible, and everyone will hate me, and I will fall apart. So you can kind of hear the sequences of misperceptions building on misperceptions. I know the teacher will forget to email you the homework, and then I'll get marked down, and you'll be mad. The movie will be too loud. If I forget my headphones again, I won't be able to stay. I'll have to walk out in front of everyone. I'm the only kid like this. It's so embarrassing. Okay. Now we'll move into treatment. And first I'll talk about kind of the big picture of, of getting the baseline anxiety down as low as possible, as low as you can do. And then I'll focus in on treatment for specific phobias or OCD issues. Um, anxiety hygiene is, is uh, the term I'm using to talk about getting the baseline of anxiety down uh, overall for the child. Um, I tried to Google this term because I don't think I invented it, but all that came up was hygiene anxiety, which is something completely different. Okay. Um, so you want to make sure the child's getting enough sleep. Um, not surprisingly, um, sleep deprivation can lead to just more emotional dysregulation in general. Uh, unfortunately, when people are anxious, uh, sleep can be harder. Um, same, same with eating, same patterns, same good things and difficulties. Exercise, you know, the research is mixed on this, but you want to see what makes sense for your own child. Um, for many, many kids, exercise, from what I see, is extremely helpful in, in reducing baseline of anxiety. And there's some um, schools now that have the exercise kind of activities before school, which I think is really great since school is often... Um, pretty anxiety provoking. Um, uh, health, um, obviously the better a child feels. Some kids as they're getting sick and um, their anxiety really spikes and their dysregulation spikes. Other kids when they're a little bit sick their anxiety goes down um, but it's just something important to attend to. Fun is kind of a, a thing to put in this list but you want to make sure your child's getting enough fun in their day and, and this may sound kind of glib but Really fun, when someone's really having fun, in general that's the opposite emotion of anxiety in a lot of ways. So um, sometimes, especially as kids get, in, get older and into middle school, it can all get pretty serious in terms of working and, and just life gets pretty intense in that way. So you just want to make sure there's enough of what the child perceives as fun, not just like on a Saturday afternoon, but throughout their, their days, little bits of fun. Um, sprinkled throughout the day, uh, and uh, enough academic success, and that can get tricky with kids with learning difficulties, learning differences, enough social successes, which can also get very difficult to go, uh, particularly with kids with um, social difficulties. So when you think about these things, you want to sort of think about the child's day, and how does it look, and how does it feel, and is there enough, are there enough points of success, points of fun, points of social-emotional connection throughout their day? Um, 
some kids can go through long periods um, in their class where they may be very well behaved answering the questions, but they may not have interactions with peers and maybe not even with adults. Um, and for kids who are anxious, their anxiety can build during those times, so it's important to look at that. Um, other uh, factors that you want to sort of do a systems check when you're thinking about reducing anxiety. One is self-esteem and self-concept, and obviously in early adolescence, throughout adolescence, um, these issues are rampant um, in terms of people trying to figure out who they are, what they are, and that's ever more complicated um, for kids who are different from a lot of kids around them. And that can lead to a lot of uh, increase in anxiety as well. Um, so you want to make sure overall that their life has, and this is easy to say, but it's important to consider. And then, of course, that the child's been supported around any potential major sources of distress, or losses, or changes, or medical problems. Obviously, in adolescence, there are a lot of special issues that can raise anxiety, physical, hormonal, the peers' social rules change. School format often changes, expectations often go up. We talked about identity issues. There's often increased awareness of differences, and that can raise anxiety. Um, old fears can, can return, and new ones can erupt. OCD issues are common. Fortunately, the brain development and maturation can help. That can, it can help with regulation, with attention, with theory of mind, and it can really help in terms of kids wanting to access treatment and being able to access treatment. Um, so it's not all bad what adolescents can bring. Okay, in terms of relationships between the sensory and the emotional system, um, there's no doubt that sensory overload can cause an increase in anxiety, and some people are much more vulnerable to this, and many people on the spectrum are. On the flip side, emotional overload, including anxiety, can also cause heightened sensory sensitivity. So when we're in a very anxious state, just like pain can be worse, um, small amounts of uh, sensory input that normally we'd be fine with uh, can put us in overload. I often give the example, if you're sitting having dinner with a friend and the friend flicks their pen a little, it might not bother you at all, but if you're stuck in an elevator um, and it's really quiet and someone keeps flicking their pen, it might bother you a lot. So um, the, the two systems are very closely tied together. Okay, in terms of um, anxiety uh, psychological treatments, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT, and its many variations and components, is the most common treatment, and there's a lot of evidence for this treatment being effective. Um, not for it being the only effective treatment, and there's some suggestion that maybe when it's part of, uh, of other kinds of treatment, it may be more powerful. Um, but certainly many of the principles behind CBT have a lot of uh, evidence for them. Um, we hear a lot about mindfulness these days, mindfulness and its many variations, yoga, music, self-talk, breathing, calming. And there are many, um, there's a lot of support for this being very helpful, and often mindfulness is done as a part of CBT. It's done as the relaxation part, um, not surprisingly, <laughs> in term, and it can be done as part of helping shift some of the cognitive errors we were talking about earlier. So these can be part of the same treatment process. And then exposure therapy or exposure with response prevention, the response meaning the spike in anxiety. So exposure meaning gradual exposure to the thing the person is scared of. Um, and that can be done gradual stepwise, as we'll talk much more about, um, with or without the cognitive and mindfulness kind of pieces. Okay, and again, I'm going to spend the rest of the time really on this topic, so don't worry if you didn't get all that. So anxiety-focused treatment breaks this, this cycle of anxious thoughts, anxious actions, anxious feelings. And treatments can enter the, this cycle at any point. Um, and, and wherever the treatment enters the cycle, presumably all the, all the different points are impacted. Okay, so you, you can work with someone just, just trying to impact their cognitive mis, misperceptions, cognitive restructuring. This is a logical cognitive process that can be done with a therapist, a parent, a teacher, and eventually by the individual. The idea is that eventually you teach the child, as they become older, an adolescent, young adult, um, to recognize, oh, I'm, I know I'm thinking this, but that's one of those cognitive errors I often make, so let me check back and consider revising that thought. Um, and obviously, we, we, none of us can do that all the time, but if we can sometimes recognize those patterns, ultimately, that's a very good um, uh, strategy to develop. Um, okay, you can enter the 
the anxiety cycle at the at the more physical end of things. Things uh, treatments like exercise, meditation, breathing, and yoga enter it enter the cycle um, at this point. And then the most common point of entry is the behavioral, the gradual exposure um, with support to decrease anxiety. And this is something that somebody can do on their own, but more, more often is done with a therapist or uh, a team um, to, to work on when, when these avoidance, escape, fight, fight or freeze are the behaviors that happen more typically with a trigger. We want to gradually expose the child to components of the situation while doing something to decrease their anxiety so they can increasingly tolerate those situations. So with cognitive behavioral therapy, um, uh, with its many variations, it typically includes teaching the child and, and family about how anxiety works, much as I've been doing um, in this talk, um, about the, and then working with some of the thoughts, some of the cognitive misperceptions that the child may be having, um, and working to untangle them, again, so the child learns their patterns over time, teaching some relaxation kinds of strategies, figuring out what's going to be effective for that child that they'll be able to access, and then working stepwise um, gradually uh, to increase exposure to the anxiety triggers. And again, we're going to talk more about that while using the, the um, relaxation kinds of uh, strategies. So now we're going to really focus in on uh, phobia treatment. And again, as you work on gradual exposure, you're also working on treating the misperce misperceptions. Um, and you, you help a child with anticipating uh, how anxious do you think you're going to feel when we walk near that dog that you're afraid of? You know, the dog's in the fenced-in yard, we're on the other side of the street. How anxious do you think you're going to feel? And then you ask them afterwards, well, how anxious were you? And let's look. Um, so there you're getting at some of the misperception of the threat is going to be unmanageable and my coping is minimal uh, when they experience uh, being able to cope with that. And you also treat the physical manifestations in whatever you're using with that particular child. You might do the deep breathing as you're walking across the street near the dog. Okay, and now I'm going to play you, if I can get all my technology working right, play you um, uh, a, a three-minute audio clip of a little bit of a treatment session with me with a middle school boy who had a lot of anxiety issues and phobias um, and OCD issues. He loved Lego, and what we were starting to use, what I was starting to use as the one of the primary tools to reduce his anxiety was to do this part of the treatment while he was... Uh, playing with Legos. He was one of, he's one of these kids who uh, can do what I could never do. He can assemble these whole complicated uh, things like the spaceship you see, you know, as we're sitting and chatting. So his particular germ and contamination phobias were having a big impact on him. So even when he was playing with Lego, he would worry that he was getting germs on the Lego. And as he breathed, he was worried about that. And he kept apologizing, wanting reassurance and washing his hands, and it was making him not even want to do that. It was impacting him in all kinds of other ways, but this was one we were focusing in on. So we're, we're using the Lego both to keep his anxiety down and to have a medium to practice the gradual exposure to germs. So he was rapidly assembling this spaceship that you may recognize while we chatted. And first he's talking, in the, in the audio clip, first he's talking about evolution and contamination anxiety. And then I shift into having him spit on a Lego using gradual exposure to see if he can not wipe it off and still feel okay. And this is the second week we've, we've uh, met, so we tried something similar last week. I've transcribed a little bit of, uh, of what he's saying, little bits of what he's saying, so, you'll, so you can understand it better, because he's a little bit hard to understand. Our contamination anxiety is kind of common. They're so common. I, I think because, I think it's protected because um, it's good to be a little bit worried about germs, right? Because, well, okay, because people that aren't worried, that aren't worried about germs at all, they evolve to, and so I have some worry of, Germs, but well, the brain, but well, if some fear of germs are alive, you know, germs like they, the one that survive and reproduce and that stuff. I think you're right. Over the course of evolution, people have yeah, some okay. fear of germs. Is good. Okay, but well, or stuff getting dirty and that stuff, there were some people with a lot of fear of germs. That wasn't evolutionarily bad, but, well, just made them feel a little like, kind of anxious. Right, it was, it was beyond the, the amount necessary. The other reason I do spit a little on the Yes. 
Oh, you know what to listen to? Something? Yeah, can we try that again? Yes, okay. You think the lady was good on um, You think you'll be able to try it? I think you can look Skywalker. Yeah. Now, are you okay? I just bite it off a little. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Oh, wow. You didn't even need the wipe system? No, I just wiped it off of my pants. Well, wow, because remember last time you did like the Lysol wipe, right? Mm, because, well, that was actual spit, not just anxiety. I think we know even did that last mm-hmm. time, didn't you? Lysol wipes? Do you remember this time? Yeah. Right. Now, do you think you could spit on a piece, maybe a piece not as important as Luke, <laughs> and not even wipe it off, just put it on the table? Mm-hmm. I think we can do that. I think that got actual spit on. Just put it on the table and see what happens. Just wipe it. Just need to wipe it just a little bit. Okay, so but wow. It seems a bit confusing. My dad says, don't wash your hands that much. Remember to dry them. Your hands will, your skin will get dry, but at school they always <laughs> have posters saying, wash your hands frequently exactly. in the bathroom. I know. Why? I know. Well, one thing is at school there are lots and lots of kids, so there are more germs. But there aren't that many. Oh, was that the spitting piece? How are you doing with that? Um, I forgot it was even the spitting piece. Wow, that's amazing. That's great. Okay, so um, hopefully you got a little flavor of what the treatment can be like. And you can see, I mean, he's he's pretty motivated and really enjoying the treatment. And I find it's not all sun and roses, but I find very often it really is. Most kids are, are pretty aware that they don't want to have these unpleasant symptoms. And um, I try to make it really fun, use stuff that they like, stuff that they like doing, and make the um, make the degree of gradual exposure something that they can feel that they can manage. So we didn't begin with some of the things that were the most um, overwhelming for him. We began with something pretty easy, just a little spit on purpose on a Lego, uh, and went from there. And bit by bit by bit, um, he did uh, make incredible gains. Um, this child, as many kids do who, are, who um, get involved in this kind of treatment, got very interested in the treatment process. Because people going through this kind of treatment can feel their, their mindset and their physical responses change. And when you're in the middle of, when you have high anxiety in response to something, it feels inevitable. It feels like you always are going to have this, you're always going to respond this way. But, and it also makes you, it can make you feel like you're crazy because you know that that's not how other people respond. You know that that's, it may not be logical. Um, so it's quite an intense experience. And then as you feel your response shifting, that can be very intriguing. And, and it's very nice that kids often get interested in the process. Okay, how does a phobia develop and evolve? Usually, usually there was some event or many events that were truly unpleasant for a child. We often can't um, trace back. What is this? Maybe experiencing, oh, okay, network connection difficulties. Okay. Um, we, we can't always trace back to what the initial target was, um, but uh, what the initial cause was. But often there was, there was something that occurred that was stressful. Maybe someone got totally startled by the fire alarm. Maybe they got totally freaked out by an exam, uh, whatever it is. Um, fear of cough could mean illness. Maybe they once, maybe they heard of someone who was very sick. So anyway, the fear ripples to everything associated with that trigger. So again, the cough might mean sick, clouds in the sky might mean a thunderstorm. And then it ripples to anticipating this thing might happen. And the anticipatory anxiety is especially debilitating because it can happen at any point, at any time. It can really take over. And then you start anticipating, anticipating, fear of fear. Um, so in the face of that cycle, what do you naturally do? Um, we avoid, we anticipate. Um, it's very natural for parents and teachers, particularly for younger children, to help them avoid um, because you never want to, on purpose, you know, make the child anxious. Um, so then you never get to experience just the event without the anxiety to relearn a new emotional thought, an uh, emotional response, and revise your thoughts or cognitions. So ideally, you could ma- magically experience the trigger without fear a few times. We could just lift all this fear off this child. Um, and then they would be cured of their anxiety. They wouldn't have these negative associations. Um, and treatment um, creates as much as possible this kind of situation where tiny droplet at a time in combination with reducing anxiety, the trigger becomes less and less potent. 
these are a lot of common concrete phobias. Um, a lot of these are sensory based, um, and a lot of them are more prevalent in younger kids. Some of them last. Um, I don't know if you recognize any of these. And then as kids get older, they get more advanced fears and phobias. Sometimes the earlier ones stay, sometimes they resolve. Mistakes in homework or homework itself, being late, unknowns, um, no's, schedule changes, all things adolescence, um, having to stop electronics or anticipating this, losing in games, worries about illness, um, and there are more abstract ones as well. And then there are uncommon phobias that sometimes kids on the spectrum have. Um, this one I thought was uncommon. I, I used to treat an individual who had a, a bunch of phobias, but one of them was um, when the thermostats were, were at odd numbers in the house, so she'd go around checking and wanting to set them at even numbers. So I was trying to find a picture on images, Google images of um, a thermostat at odd number, and I couldn't find one. So maybe more, maybe she's not the only one with that phobia. Um, so sometimes they can be treated in the same way as more typical phobias. So in general, the, this is how I conceptualize the steps um, in treating a phobia. You figure out the key trigger components of the feared issue. You unbundle it, as we've talked about a little bit. Then you design levels of gradually increasing exposure or fear ladders for each component. You determine activities that reduce the child's anxiety. So in the audio clip that was doing Legos with me was one of the activities. Um, we had a lot of others. And in general, a really playful style, I find, um, for a lot of kids, really reduces anxiety. It depends on the individual. Going through uh, each level. Um, from the, the fear ladder, combining it with whatever reduces the child's anxiety um, till you get up to the, the whole trigger. So it sounds simple, right? Okay, now I'm going to talk just a little bit about unbundling the phobias. Um, and I think it may be important to do this uh, for kids uh, who have less capacity to self-regulate and inhibit and, and to have some of these metalinguistic uh, communication discussions about their anxiety. Unbundling allows exposure, again, to very uh, gradual, uh, smaller doses of the phobia trigger. So here's an example for, let's take a fear of thunderstorms and unbundle what the likely culprits are within that. We don't always know, but we can still divide it up in various ways. There's fear of the actual sound of thunder, fear of the surprise element that it happens suddenly. Other possibilities may be fear of the, the sudden dark, the heavy rain, everybody bustling around, getting anxious, lightning. And then there's the fear of fear, the anticipating it. So then you construct these um, gradual exposure or fear ladders for each, for each of the unbundled components. So the fear of the sound of thunder and the fear of the surprise element you can separate out as, lo as well as the other elements. Um, so here's how you might do it. Um, and again, you, you adjust it as you go. So you might watch a YouTube clip together and announce just before the sound is coming on so there won't be a surprise element, YouTube clip of a thunderstorm and say, okay, when I, I count, I'm going to count one, two, three, and when I get to three, that's when we're going to hear the thunder and turn down the volume really, really low. So you're just going to get used to the sound with no surprise element. And one, two, three, here it comes. So there's no surprise, here it comes, and the sound is really quiet. I don't hear it. And then as the child's okay with that, you check in with them. You know, is it okay if I turn up the volume a little bit? Let's see. I think you can do it. And you, again, you do something with them that's going to decrease their anxiety as you do this. They might be playing with something. Um, they might operate the computer. It depends on the kid and what they're up to, what they're able to do. Um, so in terms of how you work on the startle aspect, let's say once you get them used to the volume with no surprise element, you turn it way low again, go back to the YouTube clip of the thunderstorm and say, okay, within the next, I'm going to count to three and then I'm not going to start playing it right away, but I'm going to start playing it pretty soon. So you increase the window of the surprise. And then you get up to the point where you're doing it, you know, at full volume within, you know, a couple minute window. So there's the surprise and the startle. While the child's um, doing something fun, make with you, maybe you're pretending to be scared along with them depending on their age, maybe they're doing Minecraft on their iPad at the same time, it just depends uh, on the child. And eventually you add more and more reality into the situation. And you adjust as you go along in this exposure process based on the child's response. You want the child a, a little bit afraid, so, there's, so the process is getting at the anxiety, but not so afraid that they don't want to continue, not so afraid that they can't cope. And once you start doing this with a child, um, you build up trust, obviously, that they know that you're not going to suddenly increase it. You're not going to freak them out. And you keep adjusting how many rungs on the ladder and what the strands are when you're unbundling 
because a new component may emerge. You may not have realized that, oh, it wasn't the the volume of the thunder at all. It was the sound of the rain when they're up in their room that's particularly loud that they were worried about. So then you're desensitized to that. Um, and you may need to add more rungs or go more slowly as you go. You may need to go back. Maybe that something else triggers a spikes a higher baseline level of anxiety as you're working on this process. You want to take a, do a lot of adjusting as you go. Karen, can I inter interrupt for just a second? Sure. Uh, your volume is going in and in parts. I'm wondering if um, your microphone could be turned down a spec. My microphone turned down? Yes, or, or maybe um, move it a little bit further away from you. It, it's not happening. Oh, it's constantly. going. It's loud. It's just the the sound is coming in and out. It's kind of um, sounds like there's some feedback on the other end. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I wish I knew more to more that I could adjust. Is that any better? Uh, it sounds good now. We'll we'll see. It, it doesn't happen. Is that better? Uh, it, it is right now. now. Oh, sorry about that. That's too bad. Yeah, okay. okay, just let me know. Thanks. Um, so this, what? This treatment is a very collaborative process with the child and adult, um, collaborating as they design the process and continually monitoring with the child, letting you know how they're feeling throughout, and then you um, readjust as you go. And the process, during the process, obviously, as, as you go, you're helping reprogram uh, how the child thinks about these things. As they're managing bits of the phobia, they start to see themselves as more competent, more able to cope. So their own, they, they, the underestimating of their own coping ideally uh, increases. So it builds a template for their own coping. Okay, we haven't talked much about OCD. I'll just talk a little bit about it. Um, you can think of it as the flip side of a phobia. It's a fear of not doing the action. Um, so there's symmetry touching both sides of something. There's just right OCD where you have to adjust everything to get it just right, and it often takes lots and lots of maladaptive adjusting. It takes time. Counting uh, can can be a thing. Apologizing excessively. Um, so then you do the same kind of uh, planned gradual exposure in the same way to not doing the thing. I don't know if you, know, if you noticed in the audio clip, maybe you probably couldn't tell, but the, the child was coughing a few times during it. And whenever he coughed, he coughed an even number of times, which I didn't realize at the time. But after a while, after a few more sessions, became apparent that that was a thing. That was like an obsessive thing that he felt like he had to cough an even number of times. So then we worked on that by coughing an odd number of times and seeing if he could then stop. And, you know, odd number of times, take a big while. Um, and that actually, that one didn't take that long to, to get rid of. Okay, some useful tools when you're working on anxiety. Um, YouTube is very useful for gradual exposures and also there are a lot of guided meditations. There's some nice guided sleep meditations on it and guided uh, relaxation. A lot of them are, you know, right there for free. Some you can pay for um, different, uh, in different uh, iTunes uh, ones. Mindfulness meditation apps for kids. There are new ones coming out all the time, too, that um, are currently out that I like are Smiling Mind and Stop, Breathe, and Think. Um, there's some apps uh, for uh, meditation that are... Um, for adults or children, um, Headspace is one of them. Then there's some apps that really have the whole cognitive behavioral therapy kit right in them. Um, there's one called Mood Kit. I do recommend starting with a therapist or with an adult who's really up on this and you've tried it yourself and kind of gone through the different steps and different parts of it so you really have a good handle on it. And then there are a lot of good mood tra tracking apps that range from detail to broad sweep. And mood tracking can be really helpful because, again, Remember when we were talking about the perceptions and how when you're anxious, you overestimate how bad something was often or you underestimate the good times. So mood tracking, let's say the child's reporting they had a horrible day every day when you know that actually most of the day was good. So mood tracking can be helpful for that kind of thing. It can be helpful during gradual exposure. If the child wants to predict how anxious they'll be and then record how anxious they are in the various situations. Um, and it can be helpful to, to tease apart the the misperceptions of anticipating and remembering. Then people have started to look at virtual reality, which is incredibly promising for treating some kinds of phobias where the situation is hard to uh, actually practice in small pieces. So people are using it already for flying, as you probably have uh, heard about, or, and um, 
people have done studies on using it for um, more typical situations like uh, going on the bus. I guess you could use the actual bus, but it could be helpful for fears of bees. I was trying to treat a child for a very intense bee phobia, but it's tricky how to do the gradual exposure, and you know, unless you have bees in your office or, or can go to a place um, with bees. So, so virtual reality can be helpful for bringing in things that are hard to practice on in real life. Okay, and I've talked a bit about this going special considerations when you're working with kids who can't access the full-blown CBT, um, which some kids uh, on the autism spectrum can't, um, because of language issues or because of less tolerance for small amounts of anxiety or because of difficulties planning uh, with executive function difficulties, or just it's harder to kind of inhibit and draw on the learned strategies. So you can adapt and create and monitor how you're doing. You really need to very much individualize um, your approach. You want to individualize the experiential part. You want to individualize what are the activities that are going to help to co-regulate, to help the child bring anxiety down. Um, you want to I use a lot of humor as a way to um, bring anxiety down. A lot of people do this. And um, you really want to individualize what that child thinks is, uh, thinks is funny. A lot of kids on the spectrum have unique senses of humor that can be very helpful uh, in this process. Um, socially connected humor really reduces anxiety um, proactively. It may not be helpful in the moment of high anxiety, it's usually not, um, but to reduce anxiety and when you're doing the gradual exposure. Uh, and then you can also do some humor about uh, the fear, about the anxiety. So sometimes playful exaggeration in, in role play can be helpful. Well, you want to be careful that the child doesn't feel teased or belittled in any way, of course. Medication can often be very helpful, and that's usually done by a developmental or behavior, developmental behavior real pediatrician or a child psychiatrist. Sometimes pediatricians uh, are comfortable doing it, sometimes neurologists. Um, just depends, kind of somewhat of a regional variations too. Usually medication is done in conjunction with um, all kinds of non-medication treatments, environmental treatments, the anxiety hygiene, as well as uh, specific treatments. Okay, so to summarize, anxiety is very common in people on the autism spectrum, kids and adults, and it can have huge uh, negative impact but ha happily, it's often quite treatable, um, and it often takes the involvement of home and school and sometimes therapist and doctor, um, and it's generally treated very collaboratively with the child from little kids on up, from two, three-year-olds on up, and it can be a very positive treatment experience for everyone involved. Um, we'll move to questions in a minute. I had one question in advance that I think I may have mentioned a little bit, but I'll talk a little bit about, and then I'll take your questions in a minute. Okay, what to do for the child who seems fine at school all day but may be holding it together and falls apart once they're home? Well, first you want to do the sort of anxiety hygiene sweep at home and at school, see if anything can be fixed that, that can reduce their anxiety. Um, and then you want to see if maybe their memory is coloring, their maybe their anxious lens is coloring, so they come home and say, oh, school was awful and they fall apart. Maybe school is awful, maybe it's not. Um, so you want to maybe have someone on the team do an observation and try to figure out if there are particular moments, particular things. Um, is the child holding it together during lunch and then the afternoon is really stressful but the mornings are good? Kind of try and figure it out. Sometimes it turns out the child is actually pretty okay at school and then I find that something like a mood tracking app can be very helpful, some kind of system for that. Um, it may be in between. Maybe they're okay at school but getting worn out from all the emotional effort at school. Um, putting and then they come home and the littlest thing sets them off again the straw that breaks the camel's back kind of situation um, and then you may want to have more of anxiety release valves throughout their day um, we wrote an article on the social effective diet that can be helpful I think I put a reference in that in the handout um, and there are other ways of putting that in the IEP as an accommodation um, so you have more stress relief valves throughout the day Oops, okay, and now we'll go to other questions. Next one. Well, we have... How's the audio doing? Um, the audio is better so far, thank you. We do have quite a few questions. I'll get started. Um, two of them came in regarding a nine-year-old. They are, um, my nine-year-old sometimes has trouble sleeping. Do you have any tips for that? And also, they sometimes feel anxious, um, and they tend to pick at their fingers and their toes, and they get worried about their grades. 
And so they're looking for um, tips on how to handle that. Well, sleep is one, um, you know, you obviously want to check with a pediatrician, make sure there's, you know, everything's from a health perspective in terms of thinking about the anxiety hygiene checklist. Make sure there's no physical reason why they're having trouble sleeping. Um, and make sure they're getting, you know, their energy out during the day, all those kinds of usual things. If they're up worrying, some, a lot of kids who are anxious, like adults who are anxious, when they settle down to sleep, their mind starts really spinning when you don't have the external distractions. Um, sometimes you want to make a time before then when you can settle down and talk about what, what's on their mind so you don't save the talking about your worries just before you go to sleep or just be, when you're up in bed. You want to settle maybe a time before dinner or something when you do some of that stuff. Um, there's a whole field called sleep hygiene, just like we're talking about anxiety hygiene in terms of not having too much electronics before bed, or, or what the lighting is, what the exercise is. But in terms of the anxiety component, some of these, uh, some of the relaxation app apps can be very helpful. Um, and sometimes for some kids, listening to, to calming music as they sleep can be helpful. Sometimes for listening to a very familiar story that they know so there won't be any surprises, maybe an easier story than, the, than what their actual reading level is. Um, so they have something to occupy their mind to keep it f from going around in that anxiety cycle. In terms of picking fingers and toes, I mean, that's, that's a very common anxiety symptom, and obviously you want to do every, all the kinds of things we were talking about to reduce anxiety. In terms of the... Sometimes you, re you reduce anxiety, and then you still have some of these... Uh, anxious behavior sort of leftover that may or may not trigger that mean signal um, that their child's anxiety is actually high at that particular moment. So sometimes what was an anxious uh, anxiety related behavior started that may be leftover as kind of a habit or a soothing habit. So then you can work on some, um, some substitution. You may be able to replace the uh, picking with, you know, I'm sure you've tried pickles or, you know, or whatever, something else they can pick. Um, and then there are all kinds of creams just to reduce the kind of physical urge to pick. Okay, great. Um, More the next question, yes. So the next question involves a 13-year-old boy. Um, he has high anxiety to the near pathological aversion to children, and it's mostly because of a, a noise sensitivity. Um, the person right. is looking for some advice that they're in cognitive behavioral therapy, but it's making little, little progress. Okay. So 13-year-old, right. I've seen quite a few kids who have an intense response, especially to babies, because they might cry. <coughs> and unfortunately, sometimes that can come out as, as you know, wanting to, you know, sort of the fight-flight. When it comes out as fight, that can obviously cause a lot of social difficulties. If it comes out as flight also, that can be problematic. Um, so the cognitive behavioral therapy isn't, isn't making any headway. I mean, if you've tried really good therapy and you've sort of done everything else you can do um, for anxiety hygiene and you're doing gradual exposure and not getting anywhere, then, then is when you may want to consider medications. Obviously, I don't know any of the details of that, but that's kind of a way of thinking about the stepwise approach to treating, treating the issue. You want to make sure that, the, um, that the, they're doing gradual exposure through unbundling. So I've done a lot of, I imagine the therapist has done this um, with kids with this kind of issue. I often do a lot of looking at YouTube videos, you know, see even if I can make funny YouTube videos with kids um, or find funny YouTube videos of babies and toddlers and, um, and then combine the funny with the, with the um, aversive. If you can borrow friends' kids who are um, pretty calm and who you can control a little bit and bring them in as part of, the, part of the ladder. I think the unbundling piece is really helpful, really important for this which, you know, again, they may have already done. So the sound issue, the unexpected issue, for some kids it's, it's even things like um, the baby, baby vomit can be aversive, that kind of thing. Um, so maybe there are some strands of it that haven't yet been uh, figured out that are components of, of the issue. To have some of that, especially with babies, isn't that uncommon, which may be helpful to know. They're writing in to say that it's the surprise element that's causing it and that um, the boy's reaction, he gets angry, and so the flight is the most common reaction. Right, right. And, and the problem with having a fight reaction instead of a freeze reaction is that um, it's often 
you know, it creates a lot of problems and then everybody gets mad at the kid or whatever. Not, not that everybody does, but that's a more common reaction, obviously. So fight is harder uh, to deal with because then you have all these secondary problems uh, with it. So, I mean, as much as you can do trial runs in very controlled settings where the child has an alternative to fight that might be going in the other room. So if you have two rooms and bring in a toddler into one room and tell the child, well, whenever you've had enough, you go right into the other room and go, you know, put your head under those pillows. You won't even hear them, that kind of thing, or go on your iPad or whatever it is. You may be able to accompany, you may be able to combine the working on the exposure with the child being on their iPad. When I was working on the with the child with the bee phobia, we'd go outside to the flower area where bees were likely to come while he was playing games on his iPad to, to have us another track going at the same time to help decrease his anxiety. There are a lot of ways of breaking it down. The, the, what's hard about working on something like these kind of phobias that are there in the environment is as much as you can work in this controlled environment, tiny step at a time, meanwhile, regular life goes on, the child has all kinds of exposures that are unexpected that probably are aversive, so it's hard to hard to do in a more, uh, in, a, in, a, in as a controlled way as you can do something that doesn't come up quite as frequently. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next question is regarding a 12-year-old girl, and the question is that my daughter is addicted to reassurance. How do I begin to remove the reassurance without making them think that they, um, that we don't care? Right. It's it's tricky when you start removing reassurance. You really want to explain how it works to the child, and you and then you want to treat whatever it is they're needing reassurance for at the same time as you work to reduce it. So you don't want to just launch into a cold turkey reducing it. So I was seeing a child, um, I can't remember exactly how old she was. She was about nine, I guess, and she, she had been fine with separation, and then she, some stuff happened, and she redeveloped intense separation anxiety. And so we were working on that, and she needed tons of reassurance. It had turned into, you know, a little reassurance grows into more and more and more. She needed her mother to tell her a whole bunch of things weren't going to happen when they would separate. And if her mother skipped one, she had to go back and add that one. So what we finally did, we worked, we practiced separation in little tiny ways, you know, looking out the window while she was there, going, having her go across the street while, while the mom, she could see the mom, tiny little ways of separation. But at the same time, what we did with the reassurance, with the need to be reassured, you know, a million things weren't going to happen, we got those down to an acronym, which this girl could remember. I never could, um, and her mom wrote it down finally. So it was so it was a little bit funny. It was almost like a private joke, but they would get it down into a, a written acronym, and they would just do that one reassurance. Um, it can be very hard as an adult not to keep doing the reassurance too. So you definitely want to set it up with the child. If you're reassuring five times, let's you know let's chip away at that so you can get it down to four or three, or make a shortcut for it. But at the same time, you want to be treating whatever it is to lower the anxiety. Okay, thank you. Um, another one is um, my, I think my child needs cognitive behavioral therapy and to talk to a therapist, but they refuse to. Um, what's a way that I can run this from home? What's the way that I can what? Well, I think they want to teach their child on their own. Oh, you want to do it without having a therapist because the child doesn't want to involve someone else? Is that right? Yeah. I mean, it's tricky. It can be, you know, oftentimes parents can be very successful, but sometimes it can be harder to do as a parent because you and the child together have this history of particular um, patterns that probably involve um, a high level of anxiety from what you're saying. So it can be harder to develop new patterns for the first time with someone with whom you have a series of old patterns, but, but it, it's certainly something you can work on on your own. You could also, um, you, you know, you might be able to do some, maybe you've tried this, but do some major bribing and bargaining to get the child in for a visit with someone, you know, who you pre-screen and make sure it's someone you think the child will like and make sure that the first step is making sure that that's a fun, positive experience and then build in that if you want to involve somebody else. But there's nothing wrong with, I mean, and I think it's a good thing for parents to give it a good try working on it, but just know it may be, it can be a little harder for parents sometimes because of the established patterns that you both have, so it um, can, can be harder to change uh, than it can be for a fresh person. I mean, sometimes, you know, sometimes it, for a fresh person coming in, the child may not even show some of the patterns that they, that, they, that they and the parent have developed together from when the child was very young because figure the parent's been their parent from when whatever it was truly was overwhelming for them, whereas now they're older. So sometimes fears are a leftover. But anyway, yeah, I would definitely work on it. What you might want to do, I, I think one of the easiest ways to, to get more uh, familiar with this stuff is, is through one of the apps, one of the C cognitive behavioral therapy apps. 
because then you can kind of run through it, and I would do it like with something on your own first, you know, if you don't have any real phobias. Most of us have something we can pull from, you know, make one up and go through the process using one of the apps. Okay, great. Uh, the next question is, do you see any connection between stimulant use and increased anxiety? Um, I really shouldn't comment on that because I'm not a, um, I'm not an MD, I'm not a psychopharm person. Um, so, yeah, your best bet, and, and even for these, you know, it's good to know general patterns, of course, and there are plenty of, it's kind of thing, obviously, you can look up, but, but the, you know, I always say every child is an N of one, and, and so you want to, if you notice that pattern in your own child, then that's something you obviously want to um, alert your, your child's prescribing person to. So um, there are all these, you know, large-scale studies in terms of relationships that are good to know about, but the bottom line is what works and doesn't work for your particular child that's, that's particularly important to know about. What's nice about stimulants and looking at patterns is you can try on and try off. In general, they aren't medications. You have to, you know, stay on for months to see what the impact is. Okay. Uh, there's a question in here looking at the relationship um, or asking to differentiate between anxiety and phobias. So they're wondering, when it comes to items such as low grades and making mistakes, how do you... How do you differentiate between what's anxiety and what's an actual phobia? What was the first thing you said before making mistakes? Uh, low grades. Oh, low grades. Oh, so fears of worried about low grades. I see what you're saying. So is your child just worried about not doing well or worried about messing up because they want to be a good student and they're just sort of a high achieving good student or are they, or are, do they have a phobia about low grades, or is that the question I, I'm hoping? It, it sounds as though, it sounds as though, um, how do you tell if, um, so there's anxiety about getting low grades and making mistakes, but how does that turn into an actual phobia? Or is, it sounds as though, is anxiety and phobias two different subjects? At some level, it doesn't matter. I mean, somebody might, it might not be all the properties of a phobia in terms of making mistakes. Let's say, let's say someone's just a high achieving kid who, you know, gets really upset when they make a mistake and they get really worried about bad grades and they get a bad grade, they fall apart. So is that a phobia or not? Um, at some level, it doesn't matter because you still want to do a lot of the same processes around it. They may still be, you know, we want a certain amount of anxiety. So at some level, the question is, when does that amount of anxiety become maladaptive? And if it's maladaptive, you know, if they're up, you know, at 2 in the morning worrying about this, if it's taking over their well-being, then it's something you want to treat. And you may want to treat it partly like a phobia. You may want to look at things like self-esteem and those kinds of things. Um, but you may want to also treat, treat it partly like a phobia and look at the cognitive pieces around it, um, thinking in terms of a cognitive behavioral therapy model. Like what would happen if you got a bad grade? you know, because um, the child may, may be doing some of that judgment, cognitive error, sort of attributing much more value to that, much more importance to that than it actually has. They might think, oh, I'll never get into college, I'll never have a career, I'll never make a living, um, my parents won't respect me. Um, and then the same with making a mistake, um, that sort of black and white thinking, catastrophizing. So there might be those kinds of cognitive errors going on that might be causing it to be more of a problem for that child than it would have to be. Um, if, it's, if it's just that something the child worries about a little bit and then it pushes them to do well, then it might not be a problem. But if it's enough that it's causing a lot of upset and distress, then working on it as anxiety um, and working through a generally a cognitive behavioral therapy approach might be very helpful once you've done the kind of anxiety hygiene, especially around self-esteem. Okay. Uh, this next question is regarding a 14-year-old. Uh, they're writing in, the person is writing in saying that my 14-year-old can't get out of bed unless I offer them an iPad. Is this okay or should we find another morning routine? <laughs> yeah, I feel the same way. Um, it, it really depends. I mean, I guess all these things depend. That's where it's hard because in real life you could have a little more discussion around it. But maybe I can just give how I would think about the problem, whether it's a problem. I mean, it's, I think it's a very good question because at some level 
and I didn't really mention this much, but it, this comes up with the with the girl with the worry about the grades too. At some level, you want to decide, as a parent and as a kid, is this a problem or not? It's like, well, if their iPad is always there, you know, if, if it's not a problem to give them the iPad, if once they have the iPad, then getting up at a certain point doesn't become a problem, then maybe it's not a problem. But it might be something you want to work on as a project anyway, because you might think, okay, what if we go on a trip and forget the iPad, or what? Or it could be hard. What I often see, although the person didn't say this, is once a child has the iPad, getting off the iPad becomes then an issue which might interfere with the morning. But if they just go on, do their one thing, and then they go off, I would say that's uh, pretty much what most of us do. Um, but you do want the child to know that they could be okay if they didn't do that. Um, so again, it depends how intense it is, and it depends how freaked out they would be if they can't have the iPad one morning. And if you aren't sure, you can see if the child will do an experiment with you, you know, hey, how about, you know, um, you know, do some bribe, I'll get you a new something or other if you can try this for a morning and see what happens, that kind of thing. Or you can see how hard it is, or just say, you know, I'm curious, let's see. Um, so if they're okay without it, but they prefer it, then it's just kind of a, a, a habit or a tradition or an easy way to ease into the day. But if it's a major issue and they truly can't get out of bed without it, then it might be something to work on just so the child knows they can be okay if the pattern changes. Maybe they get up, get dressed, and then get the iPad just a couple of times to know that that could work as well. It's not a huge problem from the way it's written there. And if something isn't a huge problem and other things are and it's working pretty well, um, that's a good thing. Hmm. Okay. The next question, Karen, revolves around the laddering technique. And it is, does the technique help when anxiety morphs to new phobias? So for instance, first it started out being a fear of fire, and then it moved on to fire alarms, and it keeps changing. Right. Typically, what I find is that when you treat one thing pretty effectively through the, you know, the ladder and the gradual exposure, usually that thing is gone and there might be other ones there that were maybe at a lower level and then maybe the child becomes more aware of those or often there are many of them there. I, mean, it, I find it rare that a child just has one phobia. Often there are a whole handful and then as you get to know the child better, as the child gets more open about what they're experiencing, you can you unearth more and more. Sometimes, if they're changing rapidly, so today it's the fire alarm, tomorrow it's something else, tomorrow it's something else, then it may be just sort of an elevated state of anxiety and whatever is poking through in, in that particular moment is poking through. So, you, so it may be a matter of more of the anxiety hygiene and then working on the decreasing, you know, strategies to decrease anxiety whenever it's experienced. Sometimes it's not so much one specific phobia, it's just more of an elevated baseline. Um, so then you may not want to, you might want to work on it more as the elevated baseline and what to, helping the child know what to do as they feel their anxiety going up rather than um, targeting a specific phobia if they're changing all the time. But often kids do have many. Okay. And the last question we have right now is a 12-year-old, uh, the person is writing in for advice. They're saying the 12-year-old just started showing lots of anxiety at home. They punch themselves when they get mad at themselves for making a mistake, and they're looking to find out how to address this. Yeah, I see quite a few kids on the spectrum who punch themselves when they're angry with themselves with mistakes, and I think I think it's another form of that fight flight going in going up. And a lot of kids who do really negative. Uh, comments about themselves, like, oh, I'm so stupid, I'm so inappropriate, whatever it is, and, and 12, you know, right around early adolescence is when that sort of self-reflection starts, often starts kicking in, and they become more aware of messing up and, and more determined to not mess up. So it's a tough, it's a tough uh, kind of uh, dynamic when you see it, because you just want to, you know, hug them and tell them it's okay, but um, that probably isn't enough to fix it. Um, one thing you, you can try is is the kind of fear ladder around making mistakes, and I've done that with lots of kids in a really playful way. You know, have them give me impossibly hard problems, and I groan. And you can really keep it very playful at first, um, and then you can you know collaborate with a teacher or tutor up, and to have you know gradually work into eventually making mistakes on purpose. Um, you can also obviously you want to work on self-esteem and self-concept and see what the issues are around that. Um, 
when you get to making a mistake on purpose, you know, you want to share with the child, we're going to try that and we're going to set up a mistake challenge and see how many mistakes you can make on this page and see if you can be okay with it. And sometimes it's the making mistakes, sometimes it's the being told they've, they've made a mistake um, that's the problem too. So just getting used to that. I always uh, think of, you know, when kids first learn to ice skate, they're often, they often do falling practice, which I think is great. So in some ways this is falling practice in a very controlled environment. And it won't be the same level as the sudden accidental, oh, I made a mistake kind of feeling, but it's getting gradually used to it and used to the importance of, of doing it. Okay. So those are all the questions that we have right now. If anyone else has another, we still have a few more minutes you can type in. In the meantime, I thought we could move on to uh, the slides for the AANA resources. So um, I do want to point out that we here at AANE are here to help as well. So if you do have additional questions that come up later today or in the future, uh, we provide parent coaching webinars such as these, um, as well as some in-person workshops. And we do have support and discussion groups. One of our newest programs is this parent coaching, and this is something that would provide individual support, whether it takes place in our office in Watertown or it can be done via Skype um, and online. And so, Karen, if you wouldn't mind um, advancing to the next slide. Excellent. And so if you do want more information on the Parent Coaching Program, please go to our website at aane.org and select programs and services. And under that, you'll see a link for child and teen services, and we, that has more information about this new program. So I don't see any more questions coming in right now. Uh, Karen, I want to thank you very much for today's program. I know that there are quite a few questions on it, and uh, I hope people enjoyed it. So thank you. And okay, thank great. You. Thanks. My email is on the first slide. If you think of questions later, feel free to email me. Okay, great. Excellent. So thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend, and we will uh, see you soon. Thank you, Karen. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye-bye.